My topic comes from a tax court case and that was just decided this December. Was, uh, the publication of the court case came out on December 11th. And before you tune out and you think, oh, this is going to be totally just technical boring. Yeah, there'll be some technical accounting stuff here, but also there's a there's a family story behind this, which is interesting. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to title this talking about um, what happens when you're selling mobile homes and the land that the homes are on and why that could be tricky tax business. So uh, just to give you guys a quick briefing, um, and then we can kind of see what kind of questions this brings up for you guys. Um, there was this family, it's called, their, the family name is the Joiner family, and they uh, owned and operated a mobile home and uh, basically a real estate business that sells land and uh, land with mobile homes on it. And they got into this business back in, I think, 1985. And when they started out, uh, they were just selling land. So what they would do is they would go, and this is in Arkansas. So what they would do is they would go around and they would buy uh, big parcels of land and then subdivide them into small lots and then sell them to people who would buy a mobile home from somewhere else. They would, br they would bring their mobile homes to these lots and put them on the lots. And uh, what I thought was pretty entertaining when I was reading the, the court case, I mean, sometimes court cases can be pretty um, descriptive of the background, but there was a lot of descript description of the background in the business that wasn't necessarily all that relevant to the court case, but still very interesting. So <laughs> things like one of the one of the descriptive points in the court case was they were selling mobile homes, but in fact, these homes were not all that mobile. Uh, <laughs> that the typical practice of a homeowner was to take the wheels off and somehow affix it to the land. They would uh, maybe do some improvements like putting in driveways and decks and things around these things. So they're pretty permanent, permanent residences, uh, structures, basically, uh, by the time they're moved, all moved in and everything. So, so that was kind of an interesting, um, uh, interesting flavor to the whole thing. Um, and so the, the family, the Joiner family, when they started this business, um, <clears throat> like I said earlier, they were just selling land. And then later, it was somewhere around 2000, uh, their business evolved and they actually started buying used mobile homes and uh, selling those with the plots of land to uh, potential buyers. And once they started going down that road, it also opened the door later to them not even selling, but in some cases just renting the mobile mm -hmm. homes uh, to uh, particular tenants, which as you hear more about the story, you'll realize is probably more appropriate economically because the people that they were selling to the vast majority of time actually weren't really able to make the purchases financially. So they were people with extremely low incomes and, excuse me, <coughs> we'll cut that part out or leave it in yeah. for the blooper reel i don't know <laughs> ty gets all choked up of talking about these low-income housing people right, getting yeah. screwed over by the, <laughs> the joiner family right yeah so I'll, I'll come back and uh maybe i need one more drink here hmm in uh, three, two, one. So um, their business model evolved to them selling the mobile homes, and it also evolved them to renting these mobile homes. And that made that actually makes some sense economically because it turned out that when they <clears throat> would sell the mobile homes, the vast majority of time, these thing uh, they were selling to people who had low income and were very high credit risks, and so people who often it would be known ahead of time they probably couldn't make all the payments on the sale. And so the way they would do this is they would, <clears throat> and still do it for as far as I know, I mean, the, they're still in business, um, is they, and that's what's so interesting about this case is just the business aspect of it, right? So right. what they what they would do is, or what they do do is um, with each buyer, they have two contracts. They have a, a purchase and sale agreement of the mobile home with the land, and then they have a, a note payable. <clears throat> And because their uh, buyers can't even afford a down payment, they never collect a down payment. And they would set up the note with very loose terms. They don't even kind of state, they don't really state the interest rate or the exact payment terms in the note, just that it's owed. And then what they do is they come up with some kind of payment plan that the um, buyer can afford 
essentially. Hmm. And uh, the article was saying something about how, or the tax court case itself was saying something about how those payments could range anywhere from 100 to $700 a month. So just wide variation depending probably on the value of the property itself, the that particular mobile home, and what that person can afford, right? Probably more on the latter, don't you? <clears throat> well, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sure that that was a that was a big thing. And there was there was discussion in the case how uh, the family is well respected in the community, and they and you know they really they really had a sense that they're providing income, they're providing housing for low income folks, and and so um, and and they were known and liked in the community for their work in that area. Um, and then you know the these mobile homes that they would um, sell, they would buy them um, used. And the, the costs were interesting. So uh, as of 2008, for example, the, the court case wasn't about 2008. The, the tax years in question, the IRS had audited the years 2010, 11, and 12. But <clears throat> the court case provided a lot of background before then. And some of that background had flavor like in 2008, they were able to buy these used mobile homes for like $11,000 on average, which they cited was about was less than half of what they would have to pay for the same kind of mobile home used back in 2002 as we know 2008 was the financial crisis right so they right. they were making a point about how the financial crisis that hit arkansas as well and and that it affected the mobile home industry there and and what that resulted in for uh this family who formed a partnership so from a tax technical standpoint uh, they ultimately formed a limited, a family limited partnership, which is how they were operating this business. Uh, this family was able to buy mobile homes uh, starting in 2008 really cheaply, and then sell them to, or rent them to um, <clears throat> to the to their customer base. Well, what happened for tax purposes, what, what's interesting from an accounting standpoint is how they accounted for all this. Because on one hand, you look at it and you say, well. What are they? What are they doing from an economic standpoint? Are they selling property or are they just renting property? Because they clear they had some contracts that were structured clearly as just rent, right? So that one was obvious. The sale of land was a little more clear because it was it was uh, they had never gotten to a scenario where they had sold just a plot of land and then repossessed the land. Mm -hmm. But in the scenarios where they were selling mobile homes with these with the purchase contract and the note contract. The purchase contract for the sale of the mobile home had in it a clause that said that they uh, the sale was not complete and could be rescinded if they defaulted on the note, which kind of makes sense, right? Sure. Um, and in fact, the vast majority of people did default on the note, which starts to kind of bring that. That's where my question comes up: of well, are they really renting, or are they? Is it really a sale, or is it really just? renting something in disguise, making people feel like they're buying something, but in fact, it's really economically just a rental arrangement, right? Right. And that drove the tax problem because <clears throat> what happened is when they started their business and they were just selling land, they took two fundamental tax positions. One was that they could use what's called the installment method for selling the real estate property, the land. Now, that's very common in real estate. And what the installment method does is it allows you to uh, get a note for selling a piece of property and not have to pay or and not have any gain on that initial sale, you don't have to report the gain and pay tax on it until you actually collect cash on the note. And under the installment method, the way it works is you have a little bit of gain every time you collect cash. So every cash payment you get, some of it is recovering your cost or what we call your tax basis in that property, and some of the cash payment is is considered to be gain. So effectively, mathematically speaking, what this means is whatever the gain would be on selling that property, if they were to get the full value of the note, is spread out over the term of the note. They're they're recognizing some amount of taxable income every year as they collect cash, which kind of makes sense. And, and there's a code section 453 and a tax law that governs the use of the installment method. And so when they first started and they were selling land, this is what they did. Now, one of the tricks in the installment method, though, or one of the tricky parts of the installment method is you cannot use the installment method if you're a dealer in property because you can't use the installment method for what would be considered your inventory. You can only use the installment method for other property and equipment that you might have, which almost all the time we're talking about real estate, real property that isn't considered inventory or you're not considered a dealer of that real estate. So those places like Aaron's or rent -a center and all those, their accounting is not done on a, on an installment sale Probably basis. not. Probably not. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And 
and so then um, <clears throat> where they got into a little bit of trouble with the installment method was when they um, when they started the business of actually selling the mobile homes, the used mobile homes with the land, they never changed their methodology. So they just kept using the installment method for those sales as well. So at this point, once they once they started selling used mobile homes, they actually had three different revenue streams, right? They had, right. or income streams. They had selling just land, they had selling land with the mobile home, and they had rent. And rent was obvious, right? They, they just reported the rent when they collected it in cash, but the selling the mobile home with land, they reported the same way they had sold land only. They reported on the installment method, which the IRS took exception with. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing that they did was when they first started and they were selling land, the other key tax position was they uh, put themselves on a cash basis and they were permitted to be on a cash basis. They were qualified to be on a cash basis. Now there is a there is kind of what I think is a little bit of an obscure tax law that says that if your method of accounting doesn't clearly reflect income, the IRS has the authority to force you to use an alternative method of accounting that clearly reflects income. So even though they met the statutory requirements of being on the cash basis when they first started, there's always this theoretical looming idea that maybe the IRS could claim that there, it would be better for you to report on an accrual basis and force it. I've actually never seen that happen in real life, but the IRS actually tried it in this case. Wow. So, and, and you'll, and you'll hear why the reason they tried it was because they knew they were losing on the installment sale issues. So they tried to, they tried to back themselves up with the accrual basis argument. So what the IRS ultimately asserted in this case was they asserted for the years 2010 through 2012 that, um, that the business actually had like $8.7 million more income for those three years than they had reported on their tax returns. Now, here's the comparison point. The business actually only collected cash during that period of $500,000. So the IRS was trying to say that although they'd only collected cash of $500,000, they had $8.7 million of income during that period of time. Oof. And part and the, and part of the way they were the way they were doing this is they were basically saying, "Hey, every time that you've made a sale up until 2010 and then of course for two, the years we're auditing 2010 through 2012, you should have reported as income the face value of the notes you were receiving. Even though we know that as a practical point, let's pause for a second here. We got, I think we have Liz or somebody coming in the <coughs> door down there. Is that the front door? It's right there. Oh, okay. I can't see everywhere. It's all good now. <coughs> okay. You think we're safe, Ethan? Yeah. All right. I'll come back in. Okay. Three, two, one. So... <clears throat> the IRS was claiming that they had $8.7 million of income, even though they only had cash flow of 500,000. And it was based on the face value of these notes, even though it was very obvious that they would never collect the face value of these notes, right? And so that was what was a little bit egregious about the IRS position. So the IRS, so the IRS attacked in two ways. Their, their two fronts of attack were first, look, you can't use the installment method and at first they they correctly the IRS correctly identified that you you probably couldn't be using the installment method for the mobile homes but the IRS expanded their theory and just said you know what we're just going to disallow the use of the installment method across the board fortunately they lost on that so the court disagreed with the IRS agreed with the taxpayer and said said okay look <clears throat> IRS you're right they should they cannot use the installment method for selling the mobile homes with the land but you can't disallow them from using the installment method on the land only sales. That's still fair to do. And the, and what that, what that revolved around was an argument over whether, uh, whether the joiner family, whether the limited partnership as it was, whether the business was actually making any improvements to the land. So when they actually sold the land, did they make any real improvements with the intent on selling it as a residence? Mm -hmm. And even though it's clear they knew it would be a residence, the facts bore out that they actually didn't make any improvements when they sold just the land or nothing significant anyway. And so the court said, yeah, you, you have to let them use the installment method for that. So the, so the, the joiners won, the taxpayers won on still being able to use the installment method for the land only sales, but they lost on the point that <clears throat> they could not use the installment method for the mobile home sales. Well, 
the another interesting point about the way their their accounting and their business model worked on the mobile home sales is because so many of their customers would default on the notes what they would do is when somebody defaulted on the note they would repossess the house that person would presumably leave and then they would take all the payments that had been made on the note up until that date and they would just say we're going to treat that all as gain on repossession because they had been using an installment method up till that date those payments had some of it had been profit on sale some of it had been treated as a recovery of their cost or their original cost and what but because they got the mobile home back on repossession they couldn't they couldn't say that that those payments were recovery of cost because they still had the mobile home after they repossessed it right so then they got to this point of okay well then we'll treat that as gain on repossession which is that is Typically, if you're using an installment method, that's what you would do, right? So the IRS, this is where the whole cash basis thing came in, right? Huh. So the IRS said, well, <clears throat> not only do we not think you can use the installment method, and they won on that point when it comes to mobile homes, but we also think you have to be on the accrual basis. And that means, that's why we think that you have to take the full face value of the note into your income when the transaction is first consummated at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Even though you're not getting cash at the beginning, you don't even get a down payment, we're gonna claim that as income on the mobile home sales because you got a note and we think you should be on the accrual basis. And the IRS cited their authority under this kind of obscure law that they can, that they can restate somebody's income to a basis that they think more, clear, more clearly reflects income. Now, <clears throat> from my perspective, I think it's questionable whether the IRS's basis of being on an accrual basis actually does clearly more reflect income. I think we can have a reasonable argument and say they're wrong about that anyway. Right. But the court sidestepped it. The, the court slapped the IRS's wrist and said, you may have that authority, but you missed your window to assert it. You should have asserted it a long time ago. You didn't do it you know, at the right time. And I didn't dig too far into that point. But basically, they basically hammered the IRS over technicality and said, you can't exercise that authority at this point in time in the process. So the taxpayer gets to say on the cash method of accounting, huh. which meant that the, which meant that the taxpayers here did not have to take into income the value of the note when they sold the mobile home. Or at least you would think it didn't mean that, except then the IRS came back and said, okay, We'll accept they're on the cash basis, but on a cash basis, income means receiving anything that's a cash equivalent. Uh, so they claimed that the note, note then was a cash equivalent. Now, you, you guys are shaking your heads on this because you know how ridiculous that yeah, is. Yeah. Because, hey, yeah. I mean, this is not like a note from a qualified financial institution or something. No. This, these are people who most likely won't even pay the note. So to claim that it is a cash equivalent is just ridiculous, right? Especially when you're operating in that kind of market. You know, like that kind of clientele. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that's the taxpayer did a did a fabulous job, a bang up job of bringing in valuation experts and uh, other kind of experts, accountants, valuation professionals and things to basically point out that these notes really had no fair value to them, that the face value of the note was meaningless because of the market that you're talking for that exact reason. It's just like when you see all the steps the IRS went to to try to get try to get the taxpayer in this. It, it just feels like they were just being pernicious, you know? Right. And, so, yeah. and so, you know, it's just like, it's like, okay, if we went on the installment sale, so now we're gonna force you to be on the accrual method of accounting. Oh, we can't do that? Okay, so we're gonna claim that the note is a cash equivalent. Sounds like a really uh, horrible pickup artist, right? Like I'm a doctor, I hate doctors. Well, I'm a lawyer. Right, you know, right, like, right. They just wanted like to be me. right. Right, right. They just wanted to be right. And especially because so. even if they are right, I mean, ultimately these aren't getting paid, so they're ultimately gonna get adjusted back down to something pretty similar to what the person was trying to claim well, in the so first place. Well, so this was a side issue that didn't, that ultimately didn't matter because as you can expect, the IRS threw up on the idea that these were, or not the IRS, the court. The court, the IRS wanted to call these cash equivalents, but the IRS threw up on the idea that they were cash cash equivalents the court said no way these are not cash equivalents all the evidence suggests that uh they can they can both still use the cash method of accounting which means if, that they don't have to take any gain on this until they start collecting cash that essentially made it you know once you follow the court's methodology the court's conclusion that basically makes it like rent that comes back to the question I asked at the beginning of this topic is that, okay, well, if all you can, if you have to recognize income as you collect cash on a cash basis 
the entire payment as uh, until you've recovered, until you've gotten all your income. That's basically like a rental agreement. Well, and that's what I, my, was my point is, uh, and I, I don't know if I'm dating myself here, but it used to be really in vogue in like the 80s that you would like rent to own a home. You know, like that was a path to home ownership where like, you know, there'd be some slum lord and he would own like eight properties or something and you were a resident and he would approach you and say, how would you like to buy this house? Mm-hmm. And then you would be put on one of those rent to own things. So in my mind, when you're telling That's me essentially, about, yeah, this, this, this is essentially kind of thing, how it yeah. kind of works. Yeah. Uh, and in which case, you know, like, and those, of course, he knows if he's approaching somebody for a rent to own, uh, that these people don't, you know, they, they can't go and finance a home loan for themselves. So a lot of times they would default and then it would just revert back to a rental agreement at that point. Basically. Yeah. I mean, I think the real, from a, from a, a real estate business standpoint the advantage of that whole thing is that is that you get people who otherwise are economically renters to take uh to take philosophical ownership of the property because you because they've bought it quote unquote right they purchased it so they're taking philosophical ownership they treat it as if they own it you unload a lot of the operating costs so you're like well you're the owner so you deal with property taxes and utilities and maintenance, maintenance and upkeep. You know, we're not dealing right. with any of that. It's right. your house, you own it kind of thing, right? And so you, you get rid of all that, but you still have the economics of being a rent uh, a landlord because nine times out of 10, you're going to get it back when they default on the note. It's absolutely the best of both worlds from a, from a, from a business standpoint, not from maybe like a personal standpoint, Yeah, but it is the best of both worlds. You're, you're trying to sell this asset that you know, yeah, if you can go, th- I mean, I think it's the whole catch is the catch of being in that business then is you have to go through those repossession processes and, right. and they can be, yeah. How do you do that in a way that's humane and, you know, you feel okay after coming out of it and all that sort of thing. So, I mean, that, that's what would probably keep me out of it is just my avoidance of conflict and not, not wanting to go through that process over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of how uh, it's, it's funny to me because, uh, the, this kind of i guess the mobile home the mobile home market i had no idea that it was this lucrative and this kind of like broad reaching you know besides the tax case i've heard of a lot of venture capitalists or a lot of like capital investment being made into you know like groups of investment groups buying mobile home parks as a very like lucrative way to make money you can buy these mobile home parks that usually aren't valued very much because it's just the land that's sitting on there and then you rent the spaces well as a new investment group you need to make back your your investment and so they like double or triple the rent sometimes in these places so these people that are on fixed incomes and then and to to make their money back and it it's kind of like you know the worst kind of predatory lending because you have you know those people can't up and move their mobile homes as much as the mobile home name denotes that these things aren't mobile yeah you know right and so it's a weird it, i guess it's like a weird venture capital kind of endeavor that that is happening and not to say that these folks are doing that because it sounded like they were a little bit more ingrained in the community well, instead I, I of think an outside investor i think that's kind of the, the razor's edge of which mm-hmm. side of that are you on right because right. you can imagine there's some entrepreneurs that are that are that are still making money and doing well for themselves, but they're doing it in a way to, you know, the way the implication of the facts in this case was that these folks in this particular case were doing it because they did have somewhat of a mission oriented business to provide housing to low income folks, provide an affordable uh, option for folks that could, that could work with it. Um, But then the razor's edge of it is, or is it really just some kind of predatory lending scheme, right? And so which side of that are you really on? And I think that's, um, yeah, I think think it it may be hard to tell the outsiders who don't know kind of all the facts involved. And and I wouldn't say that I know for sure. I don't know these people and I don't know all of their business practices. But the way the court case was written up, it was clear that the court or the clerks that work for the court kind of thought these folks were more on the side of trying to uh, be good citizens who provided and, and run a good business that provided affordable housing. And, and the fact pattern that you had, or at least the timeline of things that happened, right? They're kind of selling, they're selling just the land to people that are putting mobile homes on them. And then afterwards they're like, oh, 
Well, these people are then asking. It sounded like kind of like a natural progression from selling lots for mobile homes to then like people asking, well, do you know where I can buy a mobile home to put on my lot? Right. You know, kind of thing. Right. Well, as a matter of fact, I do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in the final analysis of this case, the the taxpayer won on enough issues that they certainly didn't have eight point seven million dollars of income as the IRS <laughs> was trying goodness. to stay. I was going to point out how how um, aggressive the IRS got. We were saying earlier. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned the potential for bad debt, the fact that there's so much bad debt here. The taxpayer had actually brought that up at one point and said, look, if you're going to force us to be on an accrual basis or claim that the note is a cash equivalent, then it seems like you have to allow us to claim bad debt deductions for all this worthless debt yeah. uh, that we know isn't collectible, right? And that, that would be normal tax law. And and the IRS was like, no, <laughs> we're gonna make you pay the face value, but we're not letting you have oh the we're gosh. not letting you have the worthless debt deductions either. So yeah, it was. I mean, it was that's it was so, so crazy. aggressive. Yeah, yeah, that's so crazy because like at the end of the day, cash versus accrual is just a timing question. It's not supposed to be this like right. fundamentally different where you get the two different answers over the long haul. I mean, it just sounds like that's I'm right on. And the court it. even made that exact point that. When you look at the facts over a long period of time, yeah. these folks have always reported all of the actual income that's ever been made. They've always, you know, they've never made up deductions or anything like that. Their records, by all appearances, are complete. They were using qualified professionals, a CPA firm, to do all their tax returns who uh, did this for other similar businesses in, in Arkansas. And so. Wait, so uh, there was a stable, uh, or there was like a, a large pool of like uh, mobile home, like. Uh, I guess it was, yeah, it was, a, it was an in, it's an industry. Yeah, it's in certainly Arkansas, an industry here. nationwide, but it was an industry in that local neighborhood such that that CPA had, uh, I think they said like a dozen clients doing <laughs> similar things. And um, and in fact, the taxpayer had called the CPA as an expert industry witness. And the IRS even contested that and said, well, a dozen clients doesn't make an industry expert. But, <laughs> oh, <laughs> but yeah, the, the court actually, the court actually uh, pitched back on that and was like, yeah, we, we find their testimony compelling. <laughs> we're fine. We're fine with it. <laughs> so, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's like, I mean, it, it, the part that's frustrating though, is when you look at a situation like that, where the IRS is just going, trying to be right and go after a taxpayer at every possible front in that way. And it's like, yeah, the only re the only way to straighten this out was to get a court to tell them they were wrong and to make them back off and it shouldn't be that way and and I haven't experienced that you know where we are when I've ever worked with the IRS I've always found them to be fair-minded and they're looking for the right answer they're not looking to just like jam you up with uh, a bunch of uh, arguments and yeah do you think this is one of those things like uh, I know the IRS gets a lot of grief and I am and, and from me too uh, and I think sometimes rightfully so stuff like this make right know, causes it, right yeah. Yeah. but I'm wondering if this isn't like kind of like you know like uh, you, you know like a one bad apple kind of thing where it's like yeah, maybe a so. field agent that just you know has a real like you know wet willy for giving these guys you know a tax bill I think so I mean and it's not I mean and it's something that's not unique to the IRS in accounting and finance, right. we have egos. Right. right. And it's like, yeah. we want to be right. And, but that can be a particular problem if it's, if it's an IRS auditor who right. has that under their, <laughs> under their skin. Like a, yeah, yeah. A philosophical ax to grind on, on an issue with a, with a taxpayer, I guess. Right. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. I don't, you know, after this story, I don't know who I have more disdain for that California taxing authority or <laughs> the actual IRS. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'd say I I don't have I, I don't feel like uh, I don't th I don't feel like we need to have disdain for the IRS. But I, I think these are cautionary tales. No, I know. You know? I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I was only half joking. It's a it's a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale. Yes. Yeah.